Hello everyone, and welcome to the 168th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring the characters and themes of Paranoia Agent. 20 years ago, as of February 3rd of this year, Paranoia Agent aired for the first time in Japan. And like many of Satoshi Kon's works, it's become an instant classic that's been consistently lauded as one of the greatest anime stories ever conceived. In 2005, this show had its limited run on Adult Swim in the United States, and at 11 or 12 years old, I was fortunate enough to catch it airing several times that year, and in the following one. And like so many others my age, I was fascinated with this bizarre story soon after I began watching it. And Paranoia Agent has probably had a bigger impact on my life than any other piece of media I've ever consumed. Why, you ask? Because it introduced me to Susumu Hirasawa, the man who created the opening song for this series, and an artist who served as a source of inspiration for Satoshi Kon in nearly all of his works. Once I ventured online to discover more of his music on the then-fledgling YouTube, he instantly became my favorite artist, and a testament to that is this iPod. I was never really into music like my friends and family were, but Susumu Hirasawa's works resonated with me so much that out of the 200 or so songs on this little device, over 140 of them were made by him and he continues to be my favorite musical artist to this day. So needless to say, Paranoia Agent has had a massive impact on my life. However, as many of you who have seen the show might be aware, it's not exactly the most kid-friendly story out there, which is probably why it was on a programming block called Adult Swim. And though I loved it at the time, I didn't quite understand what it was about until I rewatched it many years later. And I was even more appreciative of this series after I was able to fully grasp what it's trying to convey to us viewers. And so now I find myself in the fortunate position to share with you all the incredible insights into the human condition that the show has to offer, something that I'm sure 11-year-old me would be quite proud of. And while this video is more so an exploration of Paranoia Agent's themes and messages, it's also partly an explanation of what's going on in this series. And with that in mind, this video does contain massive spoilers for this show, but not so many that it doesn't make watching the show a worthwhile experience. And if you haven't seen it, perhaps all of what I have to say to you here will drive you to experience it for yourself. Also. I do need to say that Paranoia Agent deals with some complex and sensitive subject matter, and as I'm sure most of you are aware, YouTube is quite sensitive about certain topics. And for that reason, I've altered my language quite a bit when discussing certain topics, in order to please the almighty censors. However, just so you know, I'm not a fan of doing this, because as upsetting as these subjects might be, there's nothing like confronting horror head-on to really drive home the messages of this story. But the show can certainly offer you plenty of horror to face. So again, be sure to watch it, if you haven't seen it, after this video. I know this has been quite the lengthy introduction, but there's one more thing we need to get out of the way before we move forward with this video. Now much like Satoshi Kon's other myriad works, watching Paranoia Agent can sometimes feel like you're witnessing a fever dream in action. While you might not be experiencing this for yourself, there is a way you can experience another land of dreams with our sponsor for this video, Honkai Star Rail. Many of you might have heard of Honkai Star Rail by now, especially if you've played one of Hoyoverse's other titles, Genshin Impact. And there's a very good reason for that, because it's actually an amazing game. Featuring complex and dynamic turn-based combat, a grandiose and magnificent sci-fi world, a beautiful story filled with both excellent dramatic sequences, as well as silly yet well-done comedic relief, and a plethora of characters to discover and collect, all of which gives you a gorgeous game with hours upon hours of excellent content. And the best part is, you don't have to pay a single cent for any of it if you don't want to. But the real feature here is Honkai Star Rail's newest expansion, Penaconi, the planet of festivities, which is that world of dreams you can experience that I mentioned earlier. In this paradisal realm of wonders and vibrancy, you'll find plenty to keep you occupied, like new story additions, amazing battles, and of course, new characters like Black Swan, a mysterious crystal ball-wielding diviner who uses fate and fortune to blast her enemies with powerful dot abilities, or Sparkle, an impish and mischievous girl who supports her allies with an array of unpredictable abilities as she elegantly dances across the battlefield. But you don't have to use too much of your imagination, as you can experience all that Honkai Star Rail and Penaconi has to offer by clicking the link down below and experiencing the game for yourself. And as an added bonus, you can use my code which you're seeing on your screen to receive 50 Stellar Jade to help jumpstart your journey in this magical world. You heard that right. You can now experience a wonderful new game and get started with a bonus while you're at it by clicking the link down below. And make sure you enter my code by using the redemption feature once you get into the game. Thank you Honkai Star Rail for sponsoring this video. The story of Paranoia Agent is centered around the actions of the mysterious Shonen Bat, a boy on golden inline skates wielding a golden bat who begins assaulting people with increasing ferocity as this story progresses. We eventually learn that Shonen Bat is specifically targeting people who are experiencing some sort of distress or turmoil in their lives, or as the show puts it, people who have been backed into a corner. And it's eventually revealed that Shonen Bat isn't a boy at all, but a sort of spirit that has been growing stronger through its exploits, as well as through the attention it's received in the media and the rumors people have been spreading about its actions. And near the end of this story, we learn that Tsukiko Sagi, the first victim of Shonen 
Sinbad at the beginning of this story is actually the one who created him. One day when she was 12 years old, Tsukiko was walking her dog Moromi. In the middle of the walk, Tsukiko began experiencing stomach pains, which caused her to let go of Moromi's leash. Moromi then unfortunately ran into the street and was hit by an oncoming car, killing her instantly. Because Tsukiko's father was strict and he had bought her this dog, she was afraid of the consequences should she tell him the truth, and so she made up a story about how she was assaulted by a young boy on inline skates wielding a bat, and that he was the one who killed Moromi, which saved her from experiencing her father's wrath. Now at the beginning of this story, we find that Tsukiko is a successful artist working for a character design studio, her claim to fame being the increasingly popular Moromi character, a pink dog-like creature that's taken Japan by storm. While this has earned her inadvertent popularity with the public through Moromi, her popularity at work leaves much to be desired, as her co-workers, specifically the other women in the office, are jealous of Tsukiko's success and chalk it up to being a fluke, jealousy that leads them to making not-so-covert snide remarks about Tsukiko that has an adverse effect on her mental health. Alongside this unfortunate symptom of success, like many people experiencing Japanese work culture, Tsukiko is forced to operate under strict parameters that has her stressed beyond what she's capable of handling. As though Moromi has been a huge success, studios like hers are ever looking to find the next big thing, and Tsukiko at the beginning of this story is under immense pressure to create a new character that will top Moromi's success. Now at this point, it seems that Tsukiko has all but forgotten that fateful day ten years ago with the real Moromi, or more appropriately, has repressed any memory of that time in her life. But when she's walking home on the night of the day we meet her, that memory comes rushing back to her. As Tsukiko is walking home, she spies an odd-looking old lady rifling through trash, which startles her. But after she continues on, she takes a moment to look back and finds that the old woman is gone. And in her place, she finds an encroaching shadow racing towards her as it eats all the light in its path. Tsukiko flees and eventually trips and falls in the parking lot outside her apartment, and here on the ground with scraped knees, her belongings scattered, and her wits strained by all the stress in her life. Tsukiko remembers the fable she created when she was just a girl, a fable that allowed her to circumvent her despair, her father's anger, and her shame. And in this moment, Tsukiko made her lie a reality, and Shonen Bat was born swinging, sending her to the hospital and rendering her a sympathetic victim of a random and brutal assault by an unknown adolescent, a victim who could now use that sympathy to buy her more time to create a new character. Now just like with her dog when she was a child, Tsukiko retreated behind an excuse. Only this time that excuse was made so she could delay the deadline she was given to create a new character. And both of these actions embody the central theme of this story, the refusal to face reality and the consequences associated with that refusal. And while this is a fine enough point for us to begin discussing how this theme applies to the characters in this story, we should first discuss some of Satoshi Kon's inspiration for this series, part of which we can find in the special features section of the Paranoia Agent DVD. I didn't have access to the DVD myself myself, and the text is cut off at the bottom of this clip, but you can hear it from the man himself, courtesy of a channel called Ars Arcantum. で、例えば小学生が学校に行きたくない時にお腹が痛くなる法則とか。で、それは今大人も平気で使うと。それは昔からなのかもしれないし、わからないですけど、で、大人になるとね、例えばもっと容量のいい言い訳とかっていうのを
let alone a mechanism to base an entire story around. It may seem obvious, but let's unpack why using excuses like the one Satoshi describes here as a defense mechanism isn't exactly the greatest thing to do. When you were a kid, and you made up an illness to get out of going to school, you got to stay home from school so you could relax and play, but because you missed a day of school when you had no valid reason to do so, you purposefully set yourself up for more hardship and failure because 1. You didn't learn anything that day, which caused you to fall behind in class, and 2. You likely have had to make up whatever work that you missed when you returned, which means you only really delayed the inevitable while hurting your capabilities to excel in the various subject matter that you missed out on in the long run, which makes the momentary relief you felt here minimal when compared to the consequences of your actions. While this makes sense and is readily apparent when we're examining this type of behavior from afar, in the moment, these aren't things that people are typically going to realize, as at the end of the day, like Satoshi said, it's a defense mechanism, an escapist tool that you use when you're in distress, and it's a bit hard to think clearly and objectively and recognize that resorting to these types of excuses will only hurt you rather than help you the moment that you're in distress. Now here's the thing. The word excuse is actually a bit misleading here, as an excuse is something you use to justify being excused from something. But when you use an excuse in this way, you aren't justifying anything. You're lying to yourself and others in order to be excused from something. And though there are certain instances where you could argue that lying is a good thing to do, in general, lying is typically more harmful than it is helpful, even lies both big and small that are never discovered, as establishing a history of successful lies is bound to cause you to lean into those lies in the future as a viable way to solve any problems in your life. And so it's not necessarily that first lie itself that's wrong, but the precedent that it sets, what you build yourself into through your refusal to face reality, and how that can have a negative effect on not just yourself, but those around you. Take Tsukiko as an example. Her initial lie to her father was a success, but later on in life, that success caused her to rationalize that lying was an effective way to circumvent the negative aspects of a stressful situation. And when she lied in the same exact way once again to achieve a similar result, this lie caused her to manifest a demonic entity that began hurting people who were backed into a corner to provide them with the excuse that would solve their current problems. And as this lie spread and continued to grow through rumor, exaggerated storytelling, and media sensationalism, Shonen Bat evolved from serial assaulter into a murderous monster. A metaphorical example of one person's lie snowballing uncontrollably until thousands of people were touched by its fallout. But there's another concept that this story presents us with that is a tool people can use for escaping from reality. Willful ignorance. I mentioned earlier that Tsukiko at the beginning of this story seems to have forgotten all about her dog's death and the subsequent lies she told. And that's not because it was something insignificant that she naturally forgot, but because she repressed that memory. And a representation of that repression is the creation that bears her former dog's name, the cultural icon that is Moromi. As the story progresses, Tsukiko is first put under duress because of public accusations that she's lying about her assault, and then even more so due to the ongoing investigation into Shonen Bat's crimes. And as she's presented with these obstacles, we find that her personal Moromi doll begins speaking to her to distract her from the negative emotions she's experiencing, reassuring her that people are either jealous of her because she's successful and different, or when she's remembering things about the incident with the real Moromi, that it's in the past and she needn't concern herself with such things anymore. Much like Shonen Bat, Moromi goes on to become this larger than life phenomenon that is distracting the public with near sold out merchandise and a record breaking TV show. And just as Tsukiko's personal Moromi was distracting her from reality, the public's obsession with Moromi kept them distracted from Shonen Bat's reign of terror and deluded them into believing everything was okay until that distraction itself became a monstrous force that consumed the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of people, as the reality of their situation came to a head and could no longer be contained by this mechanism that sought to distract them from it. The colorful cartoon character dancing across your TV screen that keeps your attention as your house burns down around you. Now even if Shonen Bat and Moromi present us with a more unrealistic and metaphorical approach to what can happen when a liar delusion gets out of control, there are still plenty of others in this story who offer us a more realistic window into what harm you can cause when you behave in this way. The second victim targeted by Shonen Bat, Kawazu Akio, is a scummy reporter who looks and acts like a person who writes for the tabloids. The day after Tsukiko is released from the hospital, Kawazu, who was at the hospital she was being treated at, overhears some of the details of her run-in with Shonen Bat and decides he can make a good story out of it and potentially net himself a big payday, and he proceeds to relentlessly pursue her beyond what would be considered acceptable for a journalist. Kawazu would have likely done this with any lead, as that seems to be the type of man he is, but we discover early on that his motivation for chasing Tsukiko's story is his current obligation to pay for the hospital bills of an old man that he'd hit with his car. Kawazu is behind on his payments, and this old man's son is constantly hounding him to pay what he owes, and if he doesn't, he promises that he'll turn him into the police. Kawazu assures him that he'll be making his payments soon when he's paid, but he has no steady source of income, and his lack of funds 
as well as this man's constant pestering, are causing him an immense amount of stress. Soon after Kawazu began stalking Tsukiko, he's attacked by Shonen Bat, and though we don't really see Kawazu again after he's attacked, we can assume that his injury staved off the son's request for payment from him, as one can't expect someone to come up with money for another's hospital bills while they themselves are in the hospital. Now the ramifications of Kawazu's lie here is multifaceted. Kawazu is clearly unable to meet his financial obligations in his current profession, and he's consistently fooling himself into believing that a profession that relies on being paid intermittently is still a viable option, and that all he needs is just one good story to make everything right again. And while that is possible, he's only hurting himself by adding unneeded stress to his life as he tries to hold on to the edge of his failing profession. Because he's doing so, a man who he's harmed and his family are now potentially subject to unjustly having to pay for the harm Kawazu caused them, which will undoubtedly have an even more adverse effect on their lives than the accident itself already did. So by lying to himself, and then receiving a temporary way out of his obligations, Kawazu has only delayed the inevitable, and the reality is that in order to fulfill his obligations, and relieve himself of the immense pressure he's feeling, he needs to change professions, and accept his fate, so he can not only pay what he rightfully owes to this man and his family, but relieve himself of the daily stress he undergoes due to the instability of his profession. While this does mean that he might end up living a life of lesser stature, and feel unfulfilled as a result of losing his career, the negative impact on his psyche and well-being that such a stressful existence brings, and the further harm he could cause to people he's already harmed by continuing to live life the way he has doesn't help anybody, not to mention that if he continues on the path he's on, he's likely going to end up in jail. But like anybody in this situation, Kawazu doesn't want to let go of what he has, and that's completely understandable. However, sometimes we need to let go, and though that might hurt quite a bit, and for a long time at that, you're only worsening the pain you and others will feel by refusing to meet it head on and deal with it in the appropriate way. The fourth, but really third direct victim of Shonen Bat, Yuichi Taira, is caught in a similar dilemma. Yuichi is a model middle school student, a popular boy who has good grades, excels in sports, and seems to be the friend and idol of every single one of his peers, which has earned him the nickname Ichi, meaning number one, and he's a shoe in for the class president position that he's running for at the time Shonen Bat makes his first assault. However, part of the reason for Yuichi's success is due to his innate charisma that stems from narcissism, and he's an egotist who's just as self-absorbed as he is outwardly pristine, and we see him consistently fantasizing about receiving praise and gaining further popularity and fame. But unfortunately for Yuichi, he bears a striking resemblance to the description of Shonen Bat, and when everybody at his school makes this association, they begin treating him as if he really is Shonen Bat, despite the fact that they haven't confirmed it, which is something that can definitely happen when a person fits the description of a criminal. Now another student who's beloved by his peers is Ushiyama Shugo, a kind, gentle, and friendly transfer student who is running against Yuichi in the election. Yuichi is naturally jealous of Ushiyama, and he hates him for stealing the attention that he believes is rightfully his. And because Yuichi is actually quite rotten on the inside, and willing to do whatever it takes to get what he wants, he assumes that Ushiyama is much the same person. And rather than being a genuinely kind person, Yuichi assumes that Ushiyama is out to get him, and that he's the one who started the rumor that Yuichi is shown in bat, in order to discredit him and steal his spotlight. As Yuichi attempts to foil Ushiyama's imagined exploits, he further ruins his reputation as he's caught browbeating Ushiyama, and though he's eventually cleared as a suspect by the police, his classmates have shunned him due to these actions. However, Ushiyama remains kind to him, and when they're walking home together one day after school, Yuichi is still so sure of his suspicions that despite Ushiyama's attempts to console him and cheer him up, he still feels so pressed by the consequences of his actions and his loss of popularity that he actually ends up wishing that Ushiyama would be attacked by Shonen Bat, so Ushiyama would die, and and Yuichi can catch the real shonen bat, eliminating his perceived rival and gaining positive recognition in the eyes of the public. Ushiyama is attacked, but not by shonen bat directly. Instead, it's the shonen bat imitator Makoto Kazuka, who we'll be talking about later. And when Yuichi isn't able to catch this shonen bat imitator to prove his innocence, he falls further into despair, as he's now assumed to be shonen bat for sure by his peers, because they believed he attacked Ushiyama due to his past behavior. And after experiencing anxiety-induced delusions outside his home, he himself is hit by the real shonen bat, which then clears him of all suspicion. While this does solve one of Yuichi's problems, it does nothing to address the source of his issues, as Yuichi after this point is free to continue existing in much the same way he had prior to being labeled a criminal. And with his suspicions about Ushiyama still at the forefront of his mind, he learns absolutely nothing here, leaving his ego intact. 
which is the source of all this mess. And all these things only occurred in the first place, because Yuichi's ego blinded him to the point that he couldn't comprehend that Ushiyama is just another fellow student who's trying his best to make friends and be a positive member of his community. And once he suspected of being shown in bat, rather than accepting the unfortunate reality of his situation, taking a loss, and waiting for the speculation about his character to die down, as proof of his innocence eventually reveals itself, he deludes himself into believing an innocent boy is out to get him, and that only further destroys his reputation and gets that boy hurt in the process. Now it might seem like Ushiyama getting attacked wasn't really Yuichi's fault, as Yuichi only wished for Ushiyama to be attacked. And because he was attacked by a real person, not the actual shonen bat, we can't really say that it was his wish that made it happen. But even though Ushiyama wasn't attacked because of Yuichi's wish for him to be attacked, he was only attacked because he was walking along that street with Yuichi because of everything that Yuichi had done prior to that moment. And if he had shown a little humility here, all of this could have been avoided. Was it unfair that Yuichi was suspected of being shown in bat and subsequently ostracized by his classmates? Absolutely. Life is often unfair, and facing unfairness never feels good. But accepting a momentary loss and humbling yourself in the face of adversity is a better way forward than scapegoating your problems is, as you can see just how helpful that is when looking at Yuichi's situation. Now Shonen Bat's fifth victim, Harumi Chono, is suffering from a case of dissociative identity disorder. By day, she's Harumi Chono, a quiet and reserved part-time tutor and assistant to a professor at a university. But by night, she's Maria, a flamboyant and outgoing sex worker. Harumi is actually actively trying to work through her disorder by seeking treatment with a therapist. And while it is working, and Maria is on her way out, once Harumi's boss asks her to marry him, things take a turn for both the better and the worse. Harumi is ecstatic about the new life ahead of her, as she should be, but she decides after she accepts his proposal that she's going to forcibly bury Maria by telling her pimp that she quits, and by hiding or throwing away everything related to Maria. And she does this partly because she wants to move on to this new stage of her life as quickly and painlessly as she can, and partly because she doesn't want her new fiancé to find out that she's leading a double life that may turn him away. However, this only exacerbates her condition and causes Maria to take the reins more and more each day, as rather than continuing to work through her problems in the proper way, she's attempting to push through her pain and ignore her disorder, which almost always makes any illness you can think of worse. It's understandable why Harumi wouldn't want to reveal such a debilitating condition to her husband-to-be, as Harumi is afraid that he'll want nothing to do with her should he discover her condition. But Harumi's fear of accepting that part of herself and exposing who she really is to the world is only hurting her and those around her, as not only is it making her disorder worse, but hiding it from herself and others, and having her husband inevitably discern that she's going out at night and sleeping with multiple men, or worse, contracting a disease that Harumi picks up when she's out working, and discovering her infidelities that way, is in no way good for anyone here. And these are outcomes that will ensure that the marriage she wants to nurture ends just as quickly as it began. It would be far more sensible to just admit she has a problem to this man, and see whether or not he's willing to accept all of who she is, as one who wishes to marry another should. And if he doesn't, well that's going to hurt, but both he and Harumi will be better off for it in the long run. And this is a fantastic example of how you can't just wish away any disorder you're suffering from, and that pretending like it isn't a problem, and running from the reality that you need help to overcome the barriers that your mental health presents you with, is more harmful than the disorder itself. The second inadvertent victim of Shonen Bad via Makoto Kazuma is Officer Masami Hirokawa, a man who's as corrupt as the day is long. Masami paints himself as a family man, one who's been working tirelessly to provide a new home for his wife and daughter at the expense of his own happiness. In reality, Masami is a greedy and lecherous man who's taking bribes and loans from a Yakuza clan that operates the very same prostitution ring that employed Harumi, an enterprise that Masami frequently takes advantage of himself. And to make matters worse, he asks these women to call him daddy because of his obsession with his own daughter, which we'll be exploring more shortly. Eventually, Masami's gambling debts catch up to him, and he's blackmailed into paying increasing amounts of money to Makabe, the boss of the clan he's indebted to. Masami then proceeds to become a burglar and purse snatcher in order to repay his debts, believing himself all the while to be a heroic and righteous man who's only looking out for his family. And in the process of robbing several people of their livelihoods, it's implied that after taking a pill given to him by Makabe, that he assaults the daughter of one of the families he's robbing. After this happens and he gets drunk with his colleague, Masami reaches his breaking point and flounders in the street with evidence of his crimes laid bare, wishing for someone to come along and put a stop to his actions. But as I mentioned a moment ago, unlike others in this story whose 
problems are solved by Shonen Bat in a direct way. Masami is assaulted by the false Shonen Bat, and after he arrests him, he's given his 15 minutes of fame as the man who finally caught Shonen Bat, which puts way too much heat on him and prevents him from doing anything illicit for the time being. But Masami's issues are still very much a problem, as is evident by Makabe's presence at his interview, implying that the turmoil he's experiencing is far from over. Masami's story is still rife with this story's themes though, as not only is he lying to himself about his horrid behavior, but he's also trying to get ahead in life by mixing himself up with the wrong people and taking advantage of them. And if you believe the lie that you'll be one of the lucky few people that managed to dredge themselves in the filth of the criminal world and make it out the other side squeaky clean, you've likely got another thing coming to you. Now Masami's daughter Taiko is a different story. Taiko is about as pure and innocent as they come, a daddy's girl who is so enamored with her father that she even wished that she could be his bride when she grew up. Once the family has moved into their new house, Taiko comes home from school one day ready to create a birthday card on the family computer for her father, when she discovers evidence that her father had installed a camera in her room in order to capture footage of her undressing. Of course, Taiko is crushed by this, and as her world comes crashing down in the midst of a typhoon, Taiko nearly chooses to end her life. But as she's screaming at her father through her phone that she wishes their house would be destroyed, and that she wants to become empty, Shonen Bat arrives and does just that, hitting Taiko hard enough to cause her to develop amnesia as her family's home is eaten up by a landslide. Now what Masami was doing is horrifying, and if I were in Taiko's shoes when she found out about his exploits, I'd want to forget everything as well. But as painful as this must have been, forgetting oneself entirely to circumvent your trauma is one of the most drastic things you could possibly do in an attempt to avoid your pain. The reality of the situation here is that Taiko lost her father, and she lost him in a way that will forever mark him as a villain in her life, a man that she had once idolized more than anyone else in the world. Though Taiko loses a father here, she doesn't lose her life, and despite the immense pain one might feel in the moment that something like this happens, life still goes on. And when that life goes on, you have to ask yourself, would you rather be you, or would you prefer to lose everything that you are in order to forget your pain? You might think you do in the moment, but if you can manage to make it past all the dreaded things that plague you, and all of us have that capability, you'll come out the other side with an appreciation for the life you have and the person that you've become. And to trade that for an empty world where everything you once loved is now completely foreign to you has to be one of the worst ways that you can betray yourself. Our next group of people echo some of these same sentiments, though in their case, what they do is the definitive worst way that you can betray yourself, robbing yourself of your own life by your own hand. I've already mentioned Makoto Kazuka a few times, but after Makoto is caught and the lead detectives on the Shonen Bat case, Mitsuhiro Maniwa and Keiichi Ikari have sufficiently interrogated him and dragged the truth of his actions out of him, we learn that his story involves the desire to end it all and go out with a bang while doing it. It's unknown why Makoto is under such distress by the time he decides to turn away from life, but because Makoto looks up to Shonen Bat as a kid who, despite his age, has managed to become larger than life, we can assume that he likely led a lonely existence and felt as if he was a nobody going no Nowhere. A boy that probably hid these feelings behind an obsession with video games, as Makoto in his role as Shonen Bat has fooled himself into believing that he's a holy warrior who's been sent on a quest by an ancient master to defeat the deadly Goma, an entity possessing various individuals that he needs to seek out by looking for a red aura emanating off of the people that Goma has infected. And through his exploits as a Shonen Bat copycat, Makoto will finally gain some of the attention and recognition he desired before he finds a way to leave this world for good. We later learn that Makoto frequented a message board under the username Fox where people would share their ideas on how best to accomplish such a thing, and we learn this by following a trio who have entered into an agreement to do so together. On their first attempt, they succeed, but they aren't aware that they've succeeded, and were treated to their zany antics as they move from method to method to no avail. It's only towards the end of the episode that they're featured in that we learn that they've already passed, and it's here that we're treated to a realization that everyone who might be thinking of doing something similar should be aware of, that despite whatever horrific pain they were experiencing that drove them to this point, there's always a chance for each of us to find happiness despite it all, even in the most unlikely places, like with a couple of other lost souls who are seeking the same dreaded thing as you, and the lie that somehow whatever waits for us beyond the veil will provide you with a better alternative is just that, something that Makoto realizes too late when Shonen Bat comes to grant him his wish. Now the final character we're going to discuss before we move on to another aspect of this story is Keiichi Ikari, the lead detective working the Shonen Bat case. Keiichi is equal parts flabbergasted, dumbfounded, and disgusted by this case. When Keiichi was coming up as a police officer. He worked cases that he'd always imagined he'd work when he was fantasizing about becoming a police officer when he was a child, like nabbing burglars with burlap sacks thrown over their shoulders. Crimes and the criminals committing them became increasingly more bizarre and heinous, and Keiichi became jaded and cynical about the world he lives in, as well as his profession, which he eventually loses due to the murder of Makoto 
Suzuka by Shonen Bat, forcing him to become a security guard at a construction site. Along with the negative feelings this brought on, Keiichi had always wanted to be a father, but he fell in love with and married a woman who, despite being a wonderful and loving wife, was incapable of having children due to several expensive medical issues, which depressed Keiichi ever further and drove him to bury himself in his work so he wouldn't have to deal with the realities of his unfulfilling home life. Essentially, everything that Keiichi had always dreamed of being had turned to ashes in his mouth, and by the time everything in this story is coming to a head, Keiichi alongside Tsukiko has retreated into Keiichi's idealized world of fantasy and delusion, a world where everything is just as it used to be, and one that became everything Keiichi wanted it to be, a world where Keiichi is the loving father Tsukiko never had, and Tsukiko in turn is the daughter that Keiichi never had. Outside this fantasy land though, Shonen Bat has become an unstoppable terror who's indiscriminately murdering every single person with even the slightest issue, and Keiichi's wife Misai is currently dying in the hospital due to complications from her illness. However, Misai manages to reach Keiji through the ether, and she reminds him that he's a man who once told her when she remarked he'd be better off if they'd never gotten together, to never say such a thing, that she's just trying to escape, and a makeshift salvation is nothing but deception, and no matter how hard anything is, to not run away, and that they'll overcome anything life throws at them together. Clarity that pushes Keiji to accept his reality and allow for his partner Maniwa, who'd been endeavoring to discover the truth of Tsukiko's role in this whole affair, to finally bring an end to the terror of Shonen Bat and Moromi by forcing Tsukiko to confront her own reality. I don't think I need to explain how Keiji's actions adversely affected his own happiness and well-being, as well as the happiness and well-being of his wife, let alone Tsukiko's. And there's a lot more I have to say regarding the points all these character stories have made. But there's another source of inspiration Satoshi Kon had for creating this series that we need to discuss now that we've reached this point, Japanese culture. Like many animes, this story was created by a Japanese person whose many experiences in life were influenced by Japanese culture, both the good and the bad. In this series, however, Satoshi was trying to highlight the bad, specifically the Japanese people's refusal to face reality in certain aspects and the effect that that refusal has had on them. Many of you might already be aware of this, but Japan during the run-up to World War II and during it were for the large part wholly unjustified in waging war. The Japanese government had always styled itself as an empire, and though there had been several attempts at expanding their power before the 1930s, it was during this decade that they began their journey towards realizing their goal of dominating all of Asia. The horrors that the Japanese army inflicted upon millions of people between 1931 and 1945 have been extensively chronicled, and the crimes of this aggressor nation are appropriately looked down upon by people the world over. Well, most people that is. As most of you will be well aware, World War II ended after the United States dropped two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Saki. What some of you might not be aware of though, is what this event allowed the Japanese government to do, paint themselves as the victims to their own people. There are multiple different sources you can look to to find a more in-depth discussion on this topic, some of which I'll link for you down in the description. And it should be said before we go any further, that things have definitely changed since Paranoia Age and was released over 20 years ago. But considering that one of the articles that you can find in the description on this subject was written only 4 years ago at the time of the making of this video, what we're about to discuss is obviously still quite prevalent in Japan, even to this day. Japan has consistently downplayed its involvement in World War II to its people for nearly eight decades now, and though many people who lived through the war generally became pacifists and rightfully vilified the actions of their government, as well as the people complicit in carrying out their orders, large portions of the population who were born after the war have unfortunately become subject to propaganda and misinformation that's designed to make them believe that Japan's involvement in the war was not just minimal and justified, but something that they shouldn't really concern themselves with. Evidence for this can be found all over the internet, where you'll find interviews with people who can scarcely remember when the war ended, let alone what it was even about. And the glorification of Japan's sordid military history is still prevalent in many different aspects of Japanese society. Something that this series tries to highlight when making this point is the role that kawaii culture, or a culture centered around promoting cuteness, plays in distracting the population from these realities. At the end of this story, we see that the Moromi character has become such an obsession for much of the population that they've all but forgotten the terror that is shown in Bat. And this is supposed to be seen as a direct representation of how similar attitudes in Japanese culture in regard to all manner of kawaii media has distracted people from the realities of the negative aspects of their culture, much to the detriment of the populace as a whole. Now a good way to drive home how horrid all of this is, and how detrimental it is to the people of Japan, is to compare Japan with Germany. The revelation of the horrors that they had been complicit in inflicting upon millions of people marked a turning point for that nation and its people, as they recognized the fallacies present in their culture at that time, learned from their mistakes, and were able to reinvent 
reinvent themselves into something new by learning from those mistakes and atoning for the sins of their past, not by burying them. There are no public monuments glorifying the Nazis left in Germany, and though there are a few who still idolize that regime, when you present most Germans with reminders of their past, those reminders are almost universally met with revulsion and disdain. Of course, Germany still has its issues like any other nation, but we can't say that a majority of those issues stem from their refusal to move past who they once were. The Japanese government, on the other hand, has to be browbeaten into acknowledging or apologizing for anything that their not-so-distant relatives were responsible for, and Japanese history classes are only used as a vehicle to briefly remind their students that they were the victims of a nuclear attack, and that attack only came after they were forced to enter a war that they didn't want to fight. Not to mention that Japan continues to maintain a place of worship where people can go to pay their respects to thousands of convicted war criminals, Yasukuni Shrine, a place that even politicians have gone to to emphasize their support for their oppressive past, including Prime Minister ministers, which would be equivalent to the Chancellor of Germany making a trip to the resting place of all of Hitler's top men to pay their respects to them. Now while all of this is horrible, what Paranoia Agent is specifically trying to bring to light here is how Japan's refusal to face reality in this regard has severely impacted the livelihoods of its modern population. The root of Japan's willingness to overlook their atrocities lies within Japan's historically extreme view of shame, and one of the best examples of this, which some of you might already be aware of, is the practice of seppuku, which traditionally involved a samurai's ritualistic disembowelment of oneself after losing a battle so they wouldn't have to endure the shame associated with such a loss. But this also occurred during World War or two among soldiers and officers for similar reasons. This practice highlights just how negatively Japanese culture views shame, and while this is perhaps the most extreme example of their reactions to shame, an aversion to shaming or dishonoring oneself, one's family, or one's nation, in all aspects of life in Japan, has for a long time been perceived as being worse than death. For the Japanese, it's not understandable that a person feels distressed due to the burdens placed upon them by their bosses or families. It's a shameful thing that one needs to pretend doesn't exist. And because this idea is so ingrained within Japanese culture, it leads to people being expected to fulfill unrealistic expectations and standards that severely affect their mental health and happiness. One of the more pertinent examples of this is how the anime and manga industry in Japan operates, and just how horrific the working conditions for people employed by it are, which is presented to us in episode 10 of this series. This episode episode follows the story of a man named Naoyuki Saruta, the production manager of the studio working to create a Moromi animated series. Naoyuki is a clumsy and negligent man who consistently annoys his co-workers by acting foolishly, and at this point in time, he's on the verge of getting fired because of his behavior. Throughout the episode, we watch Naoyuki rushing to obtain and deliver different parts of the show to his production studio, and each time he visits someone to obtain their piece of the story, we find that they've been murdered by Shonen Bat, a detail that Naoyuki readily ignores. Throughout this episode, these moments moments are intermixed with Naoyuki's current task of delivering the finished tape to the network to be aired, and once he reaches his destination, he's promptly murdered by Shonen Bat just outside the studio, after which we see the network executive who was waiting for him emerge and quite literally pry the tape from his cold dead hands while showing absolutely no concern for the man who just lost his life. Now considering we're given a scene towards the end of this episode which shows Naoyuki hitting his boss over the head with Shonen's golden bat, it could be interpreted here that his refusal to face reality was Shonen Bat's solution to his problems, which meant manifested in the form of his murder of each of his colleagues, as that would fit the overall theme of driving people to extremes due to the stressors present in their workplace. But this episode is more so supposed to be a standalone story that's trying to emphasize that people in this industry are backed into a corner on a daily basis, compensated poorly for their work, and are made to suffer greatly for it, showing us the reality that the deadlines they're forced to operate under are harmful, overambitious, and unrealistic. And while their struggle here is meant to represent the manga and anime industry, and the horrid working conditions artists employed by these various companies, company's face. You can also see this scenario, along with Tsukiko's struggle at her design studio that we talked about in the beginning of this video, as a representation of all of Japanese work culture, emphasizing the uncaring nature of it, and the fact that nobody is really cut out for this type of work, and that they shouldn't have to be, as it's ridiculous to expect people to give their lives for their work. And a lot of the negative aspects of Japanese work culture, and Japanese culture in general, echoes the behaviors and expectations they've been cultivating for centuries now. However, as this series aims to point out, the Japanese were presented with the opportunity to learn from their actions and shed the negative aspects of their past after their defeat in World War II. But they instead chose to lean into ignorance and lies to save themselves the pain of experiencing the shame that comes with admitting you were wrong and that you might need to change. And it's quite sad that in the wake of all the misery that they caused and that was inflicted upon them in turn, that any meaningful efforts to establish change in their culture is significantly hindered by all these factors, as well as the people who continue to embody these ideals. And the parallels between a culture that promoted military tactics like like Kamikaze, which entailed sending men to die for their cause with
with a smile on their faces, after brainwashing them into believing this was the right thing to do, and a culture that expects its people to work themselves to death, is readily apparent. And continuing to promote these behaviors affects the populace of Japan on a daily basis, as we've seen through the many different stories of the characters that we've discussed in this video. And continuing to promote these behaviors has ensured that the problems the Japan of yesterday faced are still very much an issue in the Japan of today. However, don't think these sentiments only apply to Japan. As though these problems are perhaps more readily apparent than in other countries, every country on this planet suffers from similar issues to this day. And by absorbing this information, and better yet, by watching this series, or exploring this topic further through different sources, I hope that some of what you've learned here, or elsewhere, has made you think twice about how your country or culture might be handling their transition from the negative aspects of their past into a more positive future, and the realities that you and your people need to face in order to do so. Now, if it hasn't become apparent enough through all the stories we've gone through in this brief overview of the detrimental aspects of Japanese culture, the evil in this story isn't a boy with a bat. It's lies in all the wretched forms that they take. And the overarching message of this story is that accepting and facing your reality is always the right thing to do, as all you do is amplify any pain you might be trying to avoid when you hide from the truth. But when it comes down to it, realizing these things in the moment is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Telling lies is a comfort. It's a safety blanket that shields you from unpleasantries and negativity, an escape from the reality that so often plagues us with strife, sorrow, and misery. When you're forced to face reality, sometimes it's going to hurt, and there's a thousand different ways it can hurt. You might have to accept the fact that your job just isn't providing for your needs, and that you need to go through the arduous process of finding a new one. Maybe you need to take a long look in the mirror and come to terms with all the parts of yourself that you dread, so you can move past them and become the you that you want to be, no matter how painful a process that will likely be. The person you love more than anyone else in the world might hurt you in ways you could have never imagined, and perhaps you'll have to cut ties with them and endure the rest of your life with that pain ever present in your heart. And maybe life isn't turning out the way you thought it would, and the world seems as if it's always doing its best to try and keep you down. Life hurts, but despite all the pain you'll experience throughout it, it's important that we take the time to remember that it really isn't as bad as it seems. It's nearly impossible for any of us to always face reality, and as much as we can try to break the cycle of lies that constantly renews itself as we triumph over whatever reality is thrown at us this time around, the world and its people will likely never be completely focused on the here and now. And that's okay. Sometimes we all need a break from the world, and the many distractions that we've created that help us do just that are fine enough tools to use when we need something to escape to. But we all need to be wary of how much time we spend on the things in this world that really don't matter much at all in the grand scheme of things, so we can focus more on what's real and what matters most. Life. You know what reality is. It's staring you right in the face, and it can be unpredictable at times. But it's nowhere near as unpredictable and hazardous as lies can be. The mundane can be numbing, the tragedy can be heartbreaking, and the pain can be debilitating, but there's really only two possibilities when these things happen. You'll either get through whatever you're going through, and your world will keep turning, or you'll succumb to whatever life is throwing at you, if it happens to be serious enough, and perish. But even if the latter were to occur, hiding yourself from reality will only delay and prolong your suffering. To live is to suffer. The safest place you've ever been is your mother's womb, and once you've left that sanctuary, you come into this world screaming and confused, and not long after that, you begin to feel the pain of hunger, and the weariness that comes from a lack of sleep. And as the minutes of your life tick by, any number of unfortunate things can and will happen to you that cause you to suffer. But it's those who care for you that endeavor to lessen that suffering when you yourself cannot. The people who fill your belly and lay you down to rest when you're but a babe. The people who kiss your wounds and cure your illnesses as they're faced with aiding you in conquering a reality that you can't yet control. But in time, you gain the ability to do those things for yourself and for others. And even if you lose everything dear to you, so long as you're breathing, there's always the possibility that the sun will rise on the darkest day in your life and erase all your troubles, but only so long as you have the will to face the world and march through it with your head held high, a smile on your face, and laughter bursting forth from your soul.